Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a really nice program, nice session planned for the morning. And the first talk this morning is by Kostas Anastasian. And his talk is, What Electric Signals Tell Us About the Brain Care. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invite, Bartlett. Um, last time we, I, I was in uh, Berkeley was 2001. It was part of a road trip with, <coughs> as Europeans, you know, traveling back and up and down California. And so I don't remember it being so nice. <laughs> so something must have happened. <laughs> Simon's Foundation has been great to you guys. Um, so yeah, this is the title of my talk, or the title I, I, I thought was a good idea to present about a few weeks back. Uh, but um, and, and the motivation uh, between uh, this talk um, has to do with um, the two layers of, 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 of sort of understanding uh, the brain code. Um, on the one side, we have the um, you know brain signals such as you know calcium signals, electrophysiology signals, all sorts of uh, uh, signals. And then on the left hand side, we have the computation or the the brain code. And somehow we try to go back, uh, you know from from right to left. And um, so my, my uh, team's um, sort of uh, work at the Allen Institute, but also uh, when I was back at Caltech with Christoph, was to basically connect the two dots. And um, basically what, or the, the, our approach, uh, or how we went about it, was to try to understand uh, the detailed biophysics uh, of, of, of neurons and, and networks. Um, and the reason for that is that it's those detailed biophysics that uh, both give rise to the observables in an experiment. It's synapses, neurons, and, 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 and networks doing something. At the same time, it's the same biophysics that give rise to the code. And so, uh, so far, our work was very much motivated by understanding this to the extent that I would argue that for my work without understanding how a code is manifested in the brain makes it very hard to actually understand the code. Um, so again, and, and we've done a lot of work with experiments and theory, trying to bridge between the three levels um, of, of, of abstraction, if you wish. Uh, but yesterday, I decided I don't want to necessarily talk about all these uh, electric fields and, and and how they specifically relate to the code, uh, because I was very motivated uh, by the presentation uh, by uh, by Mari Sherman, uh, and so I decided I, I want to I want to present something different. And um, so, at the Allen, we do have uh, we are focusing our, on cortical circuits, especially in the <coughs> visual pathway of the mouse. And um, so when we look at this canonical diagrams, by the way, excellently introduced yesterday, the one thing that stands out here is this beautiful layer five pyramidal neuron that uh, has all these intricate connections to actually all layers of cortex, um, or a column if you wish, as well as thalamus, obviously. And um, it's actually the layer five PCs that are, have the ability to not just affect intracortical computations, but also project back to thalamus, right? And so that gives them a lot of power. And our, our, we were motivated to understand how they behave or what kind of computations they can perform in order for us actually to understand a little bit better uh, vision and the coding during vision. And um, so basically, my, my talk today is going to be about the electrophysiology setup of layer 5 pyramidal neurons in mouse V1, uh, the, computa the computations enabled by this EFIS setup. And then um, I'm going to introduce a little bit of some of the thoughts we have to what about how we would like to go about uh, to move from the mouse to the human um, uh, code, if you wish. Um, so I'll start with the EFIS, 
setup of, of layer five uh, mouse uh, V1 neurons. And a lot of work actually has been done in these layer five pyramidal neurons. Uh, we have one of the primary investigators of that cell type here. Um, and, and so, but we, back, a few years back, specifically with mouse V1, they were not so well um, understood or they had not been, you know, um, they have been mainly studied in rats and some sensory cortex. So we'd like to, we'd like to understand it a bit more uh, to what extent some of the principles that hold in, some, in, in primary somatosensory areas actually translate into the mouse, in mouse V1. And, and this is work done primarily by Adam Shai. And so this is basically a vanilla version of, of, of a Krakum experiment where we have channel or dopsin um, expressed in a, d a whole bunch of different areas. Um, uh, feed forward as well as feed back. And basically we have um, axons, uh, or Adam had um, axons projecting to this single layer five pyramidal cell in mouse V1, uh, basically expressing channel or dopsin. And the whole reason I'm showing you this is that, so here what these traces show is the kind of somatic depolarization you get when you shine light in each of these pixels and close to the soma or the parasomatic area, which is associated with feed forward um, inputs, you shine light, you get a somatic depolarization, and that makes sense. Uh, the reason I show this is that actually then comes a zone where you see nothing or not much depolarization, and then very far out in the tuft, there's still a second zone where if you generate or you shine light, all of a sudden you get somatic depolarizations from these far away terminals. Now, as um, actually shown by Bartlett a month ago, based on passive at least uh, dendrites, this shouldn't be happening. You should not be able to get any signal from up here, down here, based on chapter four of biophysics of computation. So the idea is then that there's something happening, there's some active mechanism that is able to get the synapses activated up here and push the charge down to the soma. And of course, as we know from uh, layer five pyramidal neurons in, 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 in rat cells, these kinds of uh, events have been mainly attributed to calcium uh, channels in the, app in the, in the apical dendrites. <coughs> And so basically, um, together with Matthew Larkham, uh, we, we, we started, we wanted to basically uh, try to understand a little bit better about how these calcium events affect the, the coding in, in these layer five uh, pyramidal cells. So here's the uh, a typical soma dendritic patch experiment with a single layer five PC. And basically what you see here is the fact that when you, when you inject the DC current one second at the dendrite, it's fairly close to the soma, so 100, 150 microns away, um, you get these very nice standardized action potentials at the soma here in black that then actually also propagate up and can also be measured by this electrode here shown in red. Now, interestingly, when you take this pipette and you push it much higher up in the tuft, and you do precisely the same kind of current injection, what you get is a very, very different uh, response at the soma, uh, as well as uh, locally at the dendrites. Basically, what you see is this huge um, 100, 150 millisecond long depolarizations, that, and then basically you go from individual spiking to bursts, spike bursts. Uh, these, again, black here is a somatic transient. Um, red here is shown what is recorded here at the local dendritic uh, pipette. And here you really see these huge events going on, right? And so obviously what's going on here is that, you know, somehow there is this zone around 300 or 400 microns away in these layer five pyramidal cells that all of a sudden, if you put enough charge in it, turns on 
and gets you from a fairly standardized spiking mode to a burst mode. And this is important because uh, the hypothesis is that bursts are much more informative for downstream areas compared to their regular spiking. Um, so, on a second experiment, now the question is, okay, so when we inject locally at the dendrites, uh, current, it can travel down a core and, and, and get and generate a different kind of uh, spiking at the soma. At the same time, we know that when we generate action potentials at the soma, those travel back. It's called the back propagating action potential. And there is an additional interesting finding there that if, you ge if one generates standardized uh, spiking at the soma, those travel down in a pretty standardized way. Once the current injections start basically inducing much faster spiking at the soma, you get a back propagating action potential, but on top of a bolus of activity seen here. And this actually slow depolarization again is also, act, is also attributed to those calcium events, which is interesting because what that means is from that in an injection at the soma, you have an event that, depending on how fast spiking happens, travels up, causes a nonlinear event at the dendrite, that then travels back down and is seen at the somatic after depolarization. Um, so we knew that that sort of thing can happen, in, in, again, in rat cells. We want to test to what extent they also happen in mouse V1. And this is called the critical frequency experiment. And what you see here is that indeed, slow spiking at 40 hertz, so triplets at 40 hertz, cause these nicely, uh, basically, uh, standardized responses. As soon as you, we increase the frequency of the triplet, you get these huge after depolarization events that are basically um, assigned or attributed to this calcium events that then travel back down. Um, and this is the quantification of that, um, that with a critical frequency in this particular case being around 90 hertz for this particular neuron. Now, these are all very complicated events. And uh, so we have a back propagating action potential. We have a, a nonlinear calcium event. We have synapses, obviously, both at the far end of the dendrites of the tuft, as well as close to the soma. So how does this all work together? And so in order to address these questions, um, we went ahead and built a simulation that was, and this is a biophysically detailed simulation that is able to account for these uh, effects that I showed you before, basically the calcium events uh, generated by the, far, the close versus the far um, electrode. And in this particular model, this uh, calcium events, as seen in the experiments, are able to create also this burst mode, which is <coughs> in, important for the coding aspects of, of this particular cell type, as I'll uh, show you in a bit. Um, so long story short here, we have a model that replicates the basic findings of, of the experiments. And so the question is then, okay, so if you have now a simulation like this, what what can you say about the life of a neuron in, in under realistic conditions? Um, and so in order to, do, to address this question, basically what we did was to take out all these pipettes because they're not typically in our brains and substitute them with um, uh, synapses. And Based on the experiments that I showed you, we wanted to look at specifically excitatory synapses versus close versus further away uh, up in the tuft and try to see what kind of modes of computations can this neuron support given the interplay of these um, different synapses in different places. And so we show that uh, when we activate close to the soma, the basal dendrites, we basically get the single spike of a neuron uh, at the soma, at the, again, red is the uh, dendritic 
um, voltage decay, uh, uh, the dendritic voltage decay, <coughs> and basically not much is happening except that single spike. You now activate, on the other hand, only the, the tuft, and what you see is that then really nothing happens, right? So what, what happens if you activate both basal and tuft? What you then see is this very nonlinear response, that all of a sudden that same neuron, the same amount of synapses, all of a sudden turn into burst mode, right? Which is very different from this in single spike. Um, and we were able to establish, I mean, we were able to establish that this is in, indeed due to this calcium uh, hot zone up here, because when we reduced the concentration of calcium channels up here, again, you go into the single spike mode. So you need these nonlinearity at the dendrites to get into the burst mode. And basically, we were all also able to show that this holds also when there is a hyperpolarization at the soma uh, with this uh, more graded effect actually shown both at the, at the soma as well as a, at the dendrite. Now, um, so the simulation suggests that there is this interesting interplay between uh, feed forward and feedback input or basal versus apical input that gets you these, this particular cell type in different kinds of, of, of spike modes, right? And the question is though, okay, this is basically the, the simulation where I'm showing you just uh, the spike frequency output of this. When I talk about spike frequency output, I mean, I mean somatic spikes. And you see that, you know, uh, up to uh, once, once a certain amount of synapses get co-activated at the, at the basal and apical dendrites, you get into this burst mode. If you only have feed forward, so basal inputs, you have these individual spikes, slower things happening. If you only get tuft inputs to some extent, nothing happens, right? Do, do the calcium channels inactivate? Yes. So that would limit the rate of bursting that would be possible. Really? Yes. So, 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 absolutely, and all I'm talking about is the first instance. Do you know what the, I'm just curious, what is the limitation of bursting in terms of how many bursts per second you can get? Do you know that? Um, so, the critical frequency, exp so, calcium events can be activated for certainly, you know, 20, 30, 40 second experiments, because I'm talking about the critical, exper critical frequency experiments, and there you go from triplets slow to fast, right? And all of a sudden you get this, this, this fast activation. Yeah, I was thinking of the time it takes to remove the inactivation. <laughs> so you have to hyperpolarize for a certain amount of time. Right, and that also depends on the ionic conditions of the solution, so it would, it would mean seconds, right? And, there, and there's actually protocols to do that faster, so but I don't know if they apply like in the brain. Then the bursting rate is relatively low. Is yes. So, so, so burst of the same neuron is, at least in, in terms of cortex, not exactly a super frequent event, right? So normally you have, you know, individual, cell, individual cells spiking at one half or one and a half hertz, then all of a sudden they get hit, right? It's this log normal spike uh, distribution that Yuri talks about so often. Yuri Bushaki, sorry. Um, sorry about so that. Back in, I think it was 2004, um, Walter Sen and Matthew Larkham had a paper, kind of, they were using current injections in the tuft, and their argument was that it basically gradually steepened the FI curve, the, which would be sort of like the response to the basal input alone, and, you know, kind of in a graded way, increase the gain of the cell. I'm not, so I'm trying to figure out, to, rec to reconcile this with that. Are they compatible or are they different results? So again, in, in our case, the limitation, if you want, is that we looked at the first, that what, we, what we cared about is only that first burst or the initial burst condition, right? We would not look, so Walter then looks at the most longer kind of time effects with the learning rules, right? That's, that's a slightly different mode of operation. But I, I, what I would argue though is that the principles I'm sort of like about to present are more general and are not mutually exclusive. So 
So the idea then is like, all right, so we have this complex thing. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Going back and forth. And then the question is, all right, so what does this mean in terms of computation? And so we wanted to see whether, so you have these two different zones, right? You have the, the local soma, and you have the apical dendrite. And you can look at them as two individual spiking zones. And then the question is, all right, so what captures what conceptual representation captures these two, the activity of these two zones uh, better? And we found, uh, so we tried the typical multiplicative and additive models. And we found that while they were applicable for certain zones, they did not do as good of a job as a composite function waveform. And then, of course, the question becomes, what is this? What does that mean? Right? And so what that means, or what this, this conceptual model <laughs> says, is that, in fact, that neuron, or layer 5 PCs, uh, basically respond to basal input, and that the job of the apical dendrites, or the feedback, is to lower the threshold of the spiking. Right? So once they're activated, the threshold is lowered, so these layer 5 neurons are more prone to spike and the spike output grows. So, and in fact, we, we, we sort of tested, and once the calcium zone, calcium uh, hot zone was taken out, <laughs> this composite waveform, the, the, its predictions deteriorated. So the calcium hot zone is required to see basically this effect here. I'm just going to try to understand what that diagram means. You've got a, the red line going down. Right. Going up, what does that mean? So what that means is that this is the spike output of the SOMAS function of the basal input. What it means is that the basal input gets you in this area here. As soon as though as the apical input kicks in, that lowers the threshold, pushes you to the left, and grows the amplitude. Right? So basically, you change. Well, it, it basically you can see it as as a mod, as a gain modulation for the for the sigmoid. Um, but but the, the top left going down red line. What does that mean? So that means lowering of the spike threshold. Oh, I see. Okay. So yeah, you you don't go up, you go down. And so um, then the question becomes: All right, so what is this? Why is this good for for vision at all? And so this is actually, we tested these different models uh, by basically feeding them in a von Mises distribution with varying compression. And long story short, um, what we found is that this composite waveform, what it allows you to do is a, a, it allows for a, tie it, a tighter orientation selectivity as function of, a, of, a, of an individual input. So basically, it's easier to tune these layer five pyramidal neurons when they have these you know, feed for and feedback activities, uh, as opposed to if they don't have them. And so, but this is, you know, just, this was a prediction based on the models that, you know, then of course, we had a Michael Heuser's paper with Spencer Smith that showed data in vivo where this actually holds, where actually you take out these calcium events in vivo, you see that orientation tuning get lost in, 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 in this layer five PCs. Um, and so the final thing I wanna say, if I have a minute, is that, um, okay, so, but then these, this, this mechanism, as we heard yesterday, we talk, you know, there was a discussion about active, uh, you know, active calcium events. Uh, yesterday, uh, also, Mark impl implied these active uh, events uh, in, in CA1. So it seems to be a more generalized mechanism around, which you know begs the question: Okay, so what what is this two-zone uh, activation good for in a general uh, perspective? And this is where I think uh, Matthew's um, ideas uh, are, are very interesting where he claims that this could be a cellular mechanism for cortical associations. So basically, the feedback or the input to the tuft could be an internal rep uh, or a prediction or an internal representation of a concept. And 
the feed forward input into the basal dendrites could be something like um, sensory input. And that what these layer five pyramidal neurons allow you to do is actually compare sensory input to their representation. And once certain, feed, certain features are there, so there's some feature completion, this backpropagating action potential together with a calcium event allow you to go, allows its specific cell type to go into this new burst mode, which becomes obviously maximally informative for the pro projection neurons. Um, I don't want to go into this. I'm more than happy to discuss it afterwards. So your first slide was a Kraken slide. Yeah. What are the inputs? The inputs there were from uh, lateral medial. Well, no, I mean, here you, you're talking about dissociating inputs onto apical versus basal dendrite. Right. 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 You're sort of you giving some hand waving, abstracted description of what these two sets right. of inputs are. Your first slide is an experiment that addresses exactly what the inputs are. What are that come to basal versus apical? Are they different? And where are they coming from? And do they match what you're trying to put? Uh, here. So that experiment wanted to show that although you have inputs going up in the tuft, right, you can see them at the soma, so that there's an active mechanism. No, I understand that that was the point that you're making, but that experiment explicitly allows you to determine the origin of inputs into different parts of the dendritic tree. Right. And um, yeah, and, and I, I don't see how that is, how you can solve this kind of hand wavy model with a Krakum experiment. Are the inputs to the basal dendrites consistent with the model that you're proposing here? And are the dendrites to the they are. dendrite consistent with the model that you're proposing? They are. But I mean, in this particular case, though, you would have Matthew thinking of a, con of a, pers of a concept like a tiger, right? And now you, need to, you have basically this association pattern completion kind of mechanism. And I think that <coughs> is hard to show beyond biophysics in a slice experiment. So actually, Matthew has done a lot of such work in vivo, right, in S1, suggesting these kind of mechanisms. Uh, maybe. Are you taking questions yet? Or? Uh, no, I, I'm trying to finish, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was supposed to finish five minutes ago. Uh, yeah, so, ooh, human brain, I don't know. Uh, we also do human brain at the Allen Institute, so we want to see from, so we get this, we want to ask to what extent some of the single neuron models or single neuron setups are present also in the human brain. We always assume that they are. Uh, that's why we use all these rodents, but it's not exactly clear that they are. And so we're pursuing this line of work at the Allen where we get tissue, brain tissue from epilepsy patients, and then we have the core facility uh, per, you know, standard, use the standardized protocols, do the reconstructions, and then we whip the computer by some of the methods, uh, you know, developed or first developed by Shaul, and then we get at least the single neuron models that can get us <coughs> going, starting these questions or addressing these questions that we are already asking in the rodent. And with that, I need a person that can do that. Uh, there's an opening right now, so for all the talented postdocs, uh, or near postdocs, um, if you're interested, uh, let me know. And uh, yeah, so special thanks to Adam, obviously, Matthew, and Christoph. And, but also, especially the last part of the work is, involves a whole bunch of people at the institute. So. And of course, uh, uh, the, the Paul Allen for his generosity. So thank you for your attention. Now I'll take questions. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> All right, we're officially out of time, but the organizers told me I could be a little bit plastic, so maybe we can take two quick questions. Like what synapse? <laughs> yeah, so there's a different way of thinking about computational modeling and the role in these circuits. So one is just what are the 
one of the neurons doing it in some sort of generic way. So being a gamma coder, if I say birth, it's just it's for phase locking. Oh, done. So I want to be talked out of that. Second point would be, uh, how do you get this signal from the distal dendrites to the soma? Hmm. Okay. So when I, when I see your work, I think, okay, maybe there's a way of turning the lights on um, back there so that the signal can get through. End of story. But it, but to 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 see to think that you could. Um, take the biophysical mm -hmm. properties of these cells and and map them in some raw bone way on, onto function is is very is it's, it is ambitious but uh, so, and, well, and it's a little I have another word for beyond <laughs> ambitious. Right. <laughs> right and so what I will not claim is that there are no assumptions there or you will be able to capture everything so in those biophysical uh, simulations that there, you know, the disc or develop to ask these questions. Of course, there was a bias is to, into like, all right, so we're interested in this, we're interested in that, we think this is important, we think that is important. It's always, I mean, for us, it's in, informative about, you know, quantifying certain things, making tasteable hypotheses, and then going back into the experiment mm. and, and showing them. And so, as, as much as I'd like to say, oh, you know, there's the simulation and we've included everything in it, I show them very, you know, next to the experiments. Because I don't believe the simulations exist without the experiments. You have to have some sort of hypothesis that you're testing, right? That, because, as you said, you're never going to be able to get everything, you know, exactly right. And, I, I, and to some uh, case, I mean, Bartlett has been, I mean, doing this work for a long time, I'd say. And, and I don't know, to what extent do you think that how much detail versus how, you know, how much abstraction is required to you know, address a question? There's always this balance that we're striving. But don't assume that I said simulation is the only thing for it. In fact, 95% of the budget of the Allen is not simulation. No, it's just one quick finish. I mean, in silicon, we have all these abstraction levels. So we have the microcode and the assembly and so blah, 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 blah. Right. And so long before we could get to a program that we could actually understand in terms of intelligent thought, we have to go through these layers. And I, it just seems that, that it, I was, when, when you started talking, I thought we were going to be down in the engine room where we sort of some, somehow turn these complicated biophysical units into some abstraction that would um, not be to, um, tied to what they do, but just made them appreciated. Uh, appreciated. Um, in, we can go down to the engine room. I mean, if, if you want. <laughs> but uh, but it, so I'm, so I, it, that was a question. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should take it to the coffee because that's a longer one. Let me take one more. Uh, yeah, Bartlett. This is the. I've learned something from, I think it was Matthew Larkham's um, recent talk um, that surprised me, and I just want to have you help, under, help me understand this. So layer one, we think of it as the tuft as being a, a place that receives input that's somehow modulatory. You said feedback. You know, people have always spoken of it as a modulatory input. Mm -hmm. And you are showing, oh, you know, when you activate the tuft, it increases the, or it makes it easier for the cell to generate a bursts. So it's sort of a gain increasing thing, a threshold lowering thing. Again, it feels a mod like a modulatory effect. Right. The thing that I learned recently from, from another talk by Matthew was that it actually seemed to be important for driving a primary sensory response. They, these experiments where they were using, they were- uh, hind yeah, The hind limb with the whisker. Thing. It looked like it was almost like the direct sensory drive of the neuron coming to layer one, and if they block that, the neuron didn't respond to the sensory stimulus, which is, a, it, which is sort of turning the whole thing upside down. How do you, what do you So, so th there, there is some of that, and Lucy Palmer had a nice paper in that, and then obviously what I have not talked about at all here is inhibition, right? And so the one of well, the reasons we did this Crackham experiment was because one of the, or look, Adam did this experiment was because we hypothesized that even more interesting than the tuft input would be the tuft inhibition that very few neurogliaform cells can abort a calcium spike and then the formation of a percept or not, right? And so Matthew had shown some data about that within Lucy's paper, right? But I am not so sure 
how that would look like in V1. Because in our hands, it didn't work. All right, let's thank Costas. <laughs>